In this tutorial, we're going to look at how this was tracked in After Effects using Lockdown, and the mesh was brought into Cinema 4D to achieve this effect. We won't get into every little detail, but we will go over tracking and displacement. To export this shot to Alembic, there's a new dropdown here, Alembic Import Export. The first consideration is the camera field of view. You need to make a guess at what the field of view is of your lens to get the best results in Cinema 4D. This isn't an actual 3D track and solve. This is just going to set up the camera so it's far back enough at the right depth to make it match with your track. In this case, I guess this is a pretty long lens. Maybe the field of view is about 30 degrees. These default values are probably okay for now and are mostly for debugging. The one to pay attention to is this reorder face vertices. I'll turn this on at first and press export. You'll also want this image as a background in Cinema 4D. So I'll shut off Lockdown and render this as a JPEG sequence at quarter resolution to import into Cinema 4D. In Cinema 4D, drag in the Alembic file, make sure to set the frame rate exactly as it was in After Effects, set your frame length, And let's take a look at what's actually imported. We have the camera, which is set to the field of view of 30 degrees. We have this background object, which will make sense in one second. And we have the mesh, which is animating. If we just go to display and turn on constant shade lines, you can see what's happening. At this point, it's a good idea to create a background material. I'd use the luminance channel. Here's the image sequence we had rendered. Make sure to calculate the animation range. And under viewport, use animated preview. So I'm just going to drag this to the background. I know there's already a background object in Cinema 4D, but this could be useful for any applications that don't have one. And I'll set this up so my view on my left is looking through the camera. And just to double check my track, it's a good idea to create a new material here with transparency on it. And make sure everything looks correct. To attach an object, I would recommend actually duplicating this mesh. And I'm going to make it editable and bring this out, we don't need this. So to make editable, it's, I just hit the hotkey, but it's this button right here. Uh, my hotkey was C. So this is an exact copy of the mesh. And then you can right click it, go to rigging, and use a pose morph tag. For whatever reason, you have to set these priorities to generator. Set mixing to points, and then drag the mesh down into here, and select yes for absolute. So now let's just scrub through this. And you'll notice that this mesh is now following the Alembic. So I'm going to disable this Alembic. And for whatever reason, when you put constraints on this pose morph mesh, it seems to work better and not have any delays or jitters as opposed to when you're putting on, on the Alembic. There's, there's some things, and I'm not blaming Cinema 4D for this at all. It's just that I don't exactly know how to set the processing order with Alembic and with constraints. So I find that just putting a pose morph on a new mesh is an easy way to make sure everything works predictably. I'm going to create an object. In this case, I'll just do a figure. And it's usually a good idea to group it. So I just hit Alt G. Right click on this, go to rigging, constraint, clamp. For priority, it should also be set to generators. In the clamp tab, under the two parameter, set it to surface. The target needs to be this mesh and as needs to be set to normal. So now we can move this. At this point, nothing happens. However, if you use lock position, this attaches, except it attaches, I think it's on a frame delay or something like that. And the fix to this is to just go back to this basic tab and set the priority to a positive number. And now that should be pretty well attached. 
To do more objects, it's just as easy as duplicating this null, shutting off lock position, moving it somewhere else, and pressing lock position again. Moving back into After Effects for a moment, I just wanted to talk about this button, Reorder Face Vertices. So when this is on, this is going to conform all of the normals. However, there's an alternate option, and we don't really know which is better at this point, which is why we've included it, where you can have this set to off. So I'll export this. I'll say no reorder in a new Cinema 4D file. I'll import this. Following the same steps as before. And if you take a look at this mesh, this is green right here. There's something that happens when you press this checkbox, reorder face vertices, where something gets screwed up at the point count, and admittedly we haven't really figured out what it is, but when you don't have that on, this is green, and then you can just press make editable on this object directly without using a pose morph tag. And in this case, it's just going to move and work like that, and then you can go ahead and constrain objects to this and do everything else in the tutorial. Now the downside to having this reorder face vertices checked off is your normals are going to be messed up. So if we go to options, back face culling, the normals are basically completely at random here. And this can be fixed pretty easily. Just go to mesh, normals, align normals, and then delete the normals tag here. And this appears to be basically the same as how we had done it with the pose morph tag. So I'm going to continue the tutorial as if this checkbox was on, moving back to my previous scene. But I just wanted to mention that this is sort of a debugging possibility that we kind of need to investigate further and it might become some use to you in the future. So now how did we do the depth trick you saw in this earlier shot? Back in After Effects, we can basically make a sort of nonsense depth map in here. So to do that, let's re-enable Lockdown and press lockdown after this shot has been tracked. And in here, we're basically just going to make it white where it sticks out and black where it doesn't. So I'll make a black solid and shut that off for the moment. And I'll make a white solid. So I've pretty much just eyeballed this. I'll feather all of these. I can hide the background, and I'll just render this out to a JPEG sequence and bring this into Cinema 4D. So back in Cinema 4D, let's just disable our mesh and look back at our Alembic. And on this, we're going to want to put a displacer object. So we'll stick that there. For shading, We'll choose this depth map that I just rendered. This image isn't going to stick as the objects move, so actually having it animate is very important to make sure that it moves where it's expected. Under Object, set this to Planar, and we want to make sure this is moving in Z negative towards the camera. At this point, it's probably a good idea to use this view, and at this point, we probably don't want this to be transparent, so we can kind of see some depth here. We'll put some color back on. On the displacer, let's just make the height something very large, like 400. So this is actually going the wrong direction. To, to make this easier on ourselves, we want to make this always moving towards camera. So instead of using intensity centered, let's just use intensity. And here, if you just see the strength, uh, if we go from 0 to 100, it's moving towards the camera. And before we even go any further, if you just play this, you'll notice that this is now attached, uh, still following. So that's great. But if we move into this view, you'll notice that as we displace, our points are no longer tracking based on where the camera was. So for example, if we look at this point right on the rhino's eye, now it's no longer on the rhino's eye because it's moved forward in Z depth, and this is going to completely break the track. So we have to make sure that as this displaces forward towards camera, 
It's corrected so each of these points stay exactly where they are in camera screen space. To do that, we can make a FFD deformer. We'll place that under the displacer. And for its position, it basically has to be between here and here, and it needs to be the same size as the resolution. So 1920 by 1080, grid points should be two for each. And as for the grid size in this uh, depth here, you just have to find out what the camera's position is. So we'll just go ahead and copy the camera Z value. And we'll make it that large. And as for the position, this needs to be halfway between. So for coordinates, we'll go to Z, paste that value there, and this is wrong. So let's make this negative instead. And now it's almost there. Now it's placed on the camera. And now we can just divide this by two. So slash two, there. All right, and what did I do wrong with the position? It needs to be more centered up here. So let's cut this in half and see what happens. Yes. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just keep this view up while you're seeing this. What, what's essentially happening is this displacer is pushing out forward into space, but really it shouldn't be pushing forward into space along this purple line, which is perfectly horizontal Z. It should be pushing towards camera along this green line. So this FFD can allow us to completely conform that. If we grab the FFD, go into point mode, and grab these points and then press the scale hotkey, which is T. We can scale this down and down here, let's just uh, force this to zero and zero. So you can kind of see what that's doing. First, let's look over here as I hit this FFD. It's nudging everything back to where it's supposed to be. And as I enable and disable the displacer, because it's, it's forcing these points to move in this camera's frustrum, as I enable and disable this displacer, there the points are moving towards camera here. But on the left, you can see it's never actually out of line with the camera's view. Whereas without this FFD effect, it would be. So that's subtle, but that's absolutely necessary. So moving back into this view, there you have it. Now this thing is about 10 feet long, which is why you're getting some jitter on there. You could probably run a mesh smooth on this or do a lot of other little things, maybe use some physics. But the point is, this is how you get started with this workflow. Also, another fun thing you can do, again, I'll just hide my Alembic so it's not visible, and we don't really need to see this figure anymore, is you can take this mesh, and go to simulate, hair objects, add hair. And this is probably the most reliable way to add an object to this mesh because it does a better job staying in the UV space in respecting the rotation of each of these faces. You may notice that the shading looks a little bit strange. Now I would just recommend taking this normal tag on the mesh and deleting it, and then you'll see your shading in a more normal way. And maybe the last thing you can do to make this a little bit easier to display, we can take the Rhino's texture from the first frame where we pressed lockdown and place it on this mesh. So I'll go to create, new material, I'll place it on this mesh. For color, I'll just choose the first frame of this sequence and not make it an animated sequence. And in retrospect, maybe uh, in this context, it looks like we made the depth a little bit extreme there. But you get the idea. So that basically showed the Alembic exporter, but what about the Alembic importer? Well, maybe you've noticed in past tutorials, sometimes it's easier to track objects on separate layers. So on this layer, I'm tracking the front leg, and on this layer, I'm tracking the back leg. What, whatever, it's just an example. However, for the final, 
you may want to get all the points onto the same layer. So now you can do that. I'm going to take this back leg layer, export to Alembic, call this back leg. And then I guess at this point, I don't need this layer at all. I could just delete it. And on the front leg layer, I can go import from Alembic and take that back leg file. And now all of those points are in there. This layer endpoint as frame zero is going to make sure that wherever your layer endpoint is, it imports starting there. So that can be a problem if maybe on the back leg layer, I'm just going to undo backwards. The endpoint was here. So just for example's sake, I'll export this again. Back leg time offset. And then I'll import here onto the front leg layer. And you'll notice that the timing is off because that's just starting from the zero frame. That's something that's very useful when working in Cinema 4D or exporting to another application. However, if your in and out points are different, the easy solution is just when you do the export and import, make sure that the layer endpoints are the same. But if for whatever reason you don't want to do that, I'll just remove these points and go back to this back leg layer. You can shut off layer endpoint as frame zero, and it will do a time code check when exporting. I'll call that back leg corrected. And once again, I'll just delete this layer so there's no confusion. And then when you import, it behaves correctly. That being said, my final advisement is just leave this on and make sure that the in point and out point are the same for both layers, but that feature is there for you. Thanks for watching. For more info, go to aescripts.com slash lockdown.